is holiness possible in the Christian church today? And more specifically, do we have saints among us? Some will say that only God knows such things, especially since here in the West, we do not exhume the bodies of the departed and leave them in the tomb indefinitely. Those of a Protestant and evangelical tradition believe that all those who have accepted the Lord in their heart are automatically saints. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verse 13, we read the believers and followers of Christ are called saints. Before they were called Christians in Antioch, the followers of Christ were called brethren or those of the way or saints. So the Protestants argue that the saints are limited to this life on earth. After they die, they are no longer saints because their bodies are in the tomb. They don't pray to the saints after they die because they don't really believe that those departed are able to communicate with us or they don't need their prayers. They receive all their needs from Jesus because he's the only mediator between man and God, as they claim. The New Testament uses the word saint or saints 67 times in reference to all believers, and they claim that scripture is very clear that all Christians are saints. So based on this, America and Europe is a land of saints. Now, we even have a football team called Saints. But if we're all saints, if we're all full of the Holy Spirit, then where are the fruits of this sainthood? Where do we see the fruit? In our educational system? In our schools? In our justice system? In our morality? Or in our spirituality? The Greek word agios has a broad meaning and a specific meaning. Agios pertains to one who renounced the world and Satan and grafted himself to the body of the believers, to the people of God. So we have the broad meaning of this word in the New Testament for all those who joined the early church, all those who were called Christians. But we also have the specific class of Christians who are not only called, but they are chosen. So according to this non-Orthodox biblical view, all Christians achieve automatic sanctity. If you are a Christian, you are saved, and therefore you are a saint. Salvation is automatic and unconditional after you recite the uh, sinner's prayer. Now, this is not entirely wrong. The thief on the cross achieved sanctity immediately or very shortly after his confession. This also holds true for those who believe in Christ by the bravery and forbearance of the martyrs. Many idolaters believed during the supernatural events that accompanied the lives of the martyrs. And yes, a lot of these up to now idolaters were executed along with the martyrs. But this is the exception and not the rule. St. Paul makes it quite clear in his epistles, that not all baptized Christians are automatically saints. They are definitely sanctified and illumined at the moment of their baptism, but they are called to maintain their sanctity and illumination after they are baptized. This is the challenge. They have been called, but now they need to choose to be chosen. St. Paul writes to the Romans, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. To all Christians who are in Rome, beloved of God, God loves everyone. We're all beloved of God. But St. Paul emphasizes we are called to be saints. He repeats the same words in 1 Corinthians, uh, in the Epistle to the Ephesians, to the Colossians to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. So sainthood is not guaranteed by our mere baptism or confession of Christ. It is a lifetime call. 
we are called to be God-like, to be Christ-like for the rest of our lives and not momentarily. We are called to go from the image to the likeness of God. Unfortunately, the Protestant or so-called non-denominational Christians have no idea that there is another kind of sanctity. And they are not convinced by the Catholic paradigm of sanctity either because the Catholic Church confers sainthood upon a person based on the person's special deeds. It is an honor bestowed upon posthumously after they die. Now, I believe God may not necessarily hold this against them because we as Orthodox have not been able to help our neighbors because we have compromised our traditional Orthodox mindset. The average Protestant and Catholic in this country have not seen a true living saint. They have never seen a Christian at the state of theosis. They do not even believe in theosis because their theology does not offer them the path to holy transfiguration and to theosis to become gods by grace. The sad truth is that most of us Orthodox are lukewarm and carnal and unable to help our families, let alone our neighbors. At best, we are at the state of the early days of the Church of Corinth. In the Christians of Corinth, St. Paul saw three categories of people, the biological men or the natural men, the carnal men and the spiritual men. The natural man is the one governed by his instincts. And in this category, we can include the unbeliever, the agnostic, or the idolater. The carnal man is the baptized Christian who has one foot in the church and one foot in the world. We love the idea of paradise, but without necessarily denying the causes of sin and the comforts of this life. This is the vast majority of our Orthodox Christians today, and the greatest enemy to evangelism. Tragically, we do not have the fragrance of Christ. St. Paul mentions one more category, the spiritual man. The spiritual man is guided by the indwelling Holy Spirit. The spiritual man is the saint in the narrow sense of the word. The Christian who emptied himself from his egoism, from his selfish will, and embraced the will of God. Some pilgrim, or, or monk rather, was asking our contemporary saint Paisios of Mount Athos, Elder, now please tell me your secret. What is your secret? My son, I, I, I don't know of any secrets. I don't know of any secret way to be close to God. No, 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 you must have a secret. Okay, if you insist, I will tell you. I simply allowed God to work inside of me. I invited God in my heart and told him to make whatever changes he wants. Now, this may sound very simple, but experience tells us that it would be easier to give up our skin than to give up our stubbornness and our selfish desires. So saints are not ordinary Christians. They are those who crucified their passions and selfish desires and live under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. Elder Sophroni from Essex said to a Greek visitor, there's only one Porphyrios in the entire world. Saint Porphyrios was not canonized a year ago. We don't canonize saints in the Orthodox Church. We, as Orthodox, simply ratify their existing sainthood. No one becomes a saint after they die. They are vessels of the Holy Spirit from this life, and what a life Saint Porphyrios had. We could use the next 24 hours speaking about his marvels and wonders. I will share one small example how true saints are the salt of the earth and the hope of this planet. A spiritual child of St. Porphyrios invited his Greek atheist relative from California, an accomplished scientist, and pleaded with him to just spend a few minutes with the elder. After some initial grumbling and opposition, he finally succeeded to bring his California relative to the presence of this contemporary saint. Moments after the initial introduction, the unbelieving scientist did not waste any time to proclaim his creed. Elder, 
I just want you to know that I don't believe there's anything up there. Now, the elder did not start any evolution creation tug of war. He used the spiritual gifts given to him by God, clairvoyance, and what clairvoyance this saying had. He says, Mr. Michael, your house is located in Northern California, and he began to describe his home to the T. Now, in the very back of your yard, you have your fence, and next to the fence, there is an evergreen tree about 20 feet high. Now, 10 feet away and to the left of the tree and five feet from the fence, there's a hidden treasure about six feet underground. Now, be careful and discreet when you are digging up this treasure so no one sees you. And by the way, don't get any ideas. It is the only one there. Don't dig up your whole yard thinking you might find something else. Well, Monday morning, after this amazing revelation, our highly perplexed scientist flew to California, dug up the ground according to the specs of the elder, and found a box full of gold coins. A week later, he flew back to Athens, went to the elder, and confessed his faith in God. This is the exact miracle that Christ used to attract Nathaniel when Philip told him, we found Christ, we found the Messiah. And Nathaniel says, is there anything good that can come out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come and see. And a few minutes later, Nathaniel believed because Christ told him, oh, I saw you under the fig tree. There are hundreds, if not thousands, of such miracles in the life of this most bizarre saint, Saint Porphyrios. Thousands of people have found their lost faith after visiting these precious vessels of the Holy Spirit. Last century alone, we have dozens of such saintly elders in the world of orthodoxy. In the absence of these saints, the West cannot interpret the gospel. I am from a Greek Orthodox background, and we suffer greatly here in America due to the absence of Orthodox saints. There was a time where many of our parishioners would leave our flat-footed Orthodox churches to experience the false gifts of the Charismatics. Our priests would bring in pseudo-Charismatics to help them with the gifts of speaking in tongues and other things. We lost thousands of Orthodox to the Pentecostals and other denominations. All this came to a sudden halt after the establishment of St. Anthony's in Arizona and the other 17 monasteries. The church always had the rank of the saints. The stylites, the pole dwellers, appeared after the 5th century, after Simeon the stylite. And then we had the fools for Christ, another category of saints, six in Greece and 36 in Russia. These saints are the authentication of the gospel. The lives of the saints is really the only way to understand the Acts of the Apostles and the entire New Testament. There's a joke about someone from Corfu who lost his faith in God at some point and was heard saying, okay, I, I may not believe in God, but I will never stop believing in my saint spirit. Sure, this poor man probably never read the scriptures. He did not have much catechism in his home, so he doesn't know much about God and the Bible. But he cannot ignore all the healings and miracles of St. Spirit on, on the island that he was born and grew up on, the island of Corfu. So who is a saint in the Orthodox Church? The philanthropist? The men of good deeds? The compassionate men? The ethical men? Perhaps, but this is not enough. I will bring to your attention at least four elements that characterize the life of a true saint. The first element includes the very things that I just mentioned. A saint is a man of virtues. He is full of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Second, he is illumined. He possesses wisdom from above. He has discretion and discernment. He can see the plan of God and the will of God in our lives. He can test the spirits and discern what's from God and what is a delusion. And this is why we all want to go to an illumined father, to a holy elder, to tell us about our life in general. Number three, a saint is not only wise but powerful. 
A saint is not a wishy-washy. He has power of soul, willpower. Bravery is an indispensable element of Christian sanctity. He may be meek and gentle and polite, but when needed, he will become a giant. This power is from above. This is the power that was promised by the Holy Spirit after the resurrection. Christ told the semi-confused disciples, do not venture far from Jerusalem until you've received power from above, from on high. The fourth element of the saying is to have signs of faith, miraculous powers, not only after he dies, but during his life. And now we will begin to analyze these four elements and we'll begin with the first one the element of virtues and fruits of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul speaks about the nine fruits of the Holy Spirit in Galatians. For the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. These are not the only virtues of the saints, but a very good start. They are called fruits and not gifts. Grace is a gift. The sacraments are a gift. We don't have to pay for Holy Communion or Holy Confession. Grace means just that, something free, a gift. But a fruit or a virtue requires our effort in combination with the grace of God. And this is where we highly differ with the Protestants. We must want to acquire these fruits, and in order to do so, we have to cultivate the ground of our heart, something made clear in the parable of the sower. The seed is free, the sower is God, but we will dictate the quality of the soil of our heart. The preparation of the garden of our heart is our choice and our responsibility. If we don't uproot the thorns, they will choke the good seed. So a fruit or a virtue requires the synergy of the grace of God and the free will of men. Salvation is synergistic in orthodoxy. The one who created me without my will cannot save me without my will, according to Holy Augustine. We are called, we are all called, but we must daily choose between Christ and the world, between God and Belial, between the truth and the delusion. Yes, we are called, but we must daily choose to be chosen. So a saint is not the one who confesses the Nicene Creed or the one who prayed the sinner's prayer once upon a time. A saint is the Christian fighter who uprooted his evil passions. He purified the ground of his heart and then planted fruit-producing shrubs and trees, and all this by the grace of God and as a member of the church. In more theological terms, a saint is the person who transformed the distorted energies of his soul and brought them back to the pre-fallen state. The true believer who took the fallen image of Adam and worked or allowed God rather to work inside of him and bring him to the state of illumination or likeness of God. So a true saint is a person of love, a magnet because of his unceasing joy, a truly charismatic person because of the peace that transcends all understanding, a peace of another kind, unusual and not of this world. The saint has forbearance. What is forbearance? The ability to persevere and be unmoved by pain, illness, injustice, persecution, and slander. The ability to reconcile, to reconcile irreconcilable differences, not in matters of faith, but in matters of character. With this fruit of the Holy Spirit, we are given the strength to accept people as they are without wanting to mold them according to our image and likeness, a horrible passion that brings much pain and suffering in today's marriages. We love unconditionally, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, to be kind and gentle and good and merciful. We often fall very short in these virtues as members of the Church of Christ today. We do not have the heart of the Good Samaritan. We give sparingly and calculatively. The saints give it all because they love the world with all their heart. Their love is sacrificial. Someone asked Elder Paisios, Elder, please tell us something about love. 
about love, about love. Hmm. I would like to take my heart and cut it in thousands of little pieces and offer it to my brothers and sisters in the world. Faith, meekness, self-control. This faith is not limited to the defense of doctrine or to be faithful to the commandments only, but to entrust my life in the hands of God. We usually have no problem arguing in matters of faith, defending creation, defending the unborn, defending our church tradition, but we have much difficulty committing ourselves and one another to Christ our God, to surrender our life to the will of God. True prayer, advanced prayer does not seek tangible things, things of this world. True prayer is to ask for the strength to trust our life in the hands of God. To achieve this, we need the help of the All-Holy, the Most Holy, the Mother of God, the Theotokos. It is not by accident that, the most, that this most needful prayer is heard repeatedly in every Vespers, Matins, and Liturgy, remembering to ask the intercessions of the Most Holy Theotokos to help us with this faithfulness, the strength to trust our entire life in the hands of God. Remembering our most holy, pure, blessed, and glorious Lady, the Theotokos, and ever-Virgin Mary, with all the saints, let us commit ourselves and one another and our whole life to Christ our God. This is the faith that makes saints, complete trust and confidence in the will of God. We must come to the point to fully believe that whatever God our Father permits in our life, it is out of His eternal love and for our eternal good. So faith, meekness, and self-control, all these virtues, all these fruits of the Holy Spirit abound plentifully in the Orthodox saints. Needless to say, the ground of all these fruits is humility. Love and humility are two inseparable sisters. Meekness and humility are the content of Christ's heart. Learn from me, for I am of a meek and humble heart. And of course, all this is not easy. It takes ascesis. And the Orthodox Church is very ascetic in character. Every year, we have at least 200 fasting days to begin the stadium of virtues with self-control. Self-control is the beginning of humility. Fasting is a matter of self-control and humility. I give up my own will and desires to do obedience to God and His Church. In the hymnology of the Church, fasting is called the Queen of Virtues. So we begin with fasting and humility, and we eventually enrich ourselves with the entire array of virtues. We begin with a purification of our heart and a denial of the old Adamic nature. And only after this necessary struggle, we will be decorated with the heavenly fruits of the Holy Spirit. So much about the first element of Orthodox sainthood. The second element of the saint is to know the will of God in his life and to have wisdom from above, to have discernment, to be able to test the spirits. This can only take place after the purification of the heart. We have plenty of examples of hermits and monastics who were deceived by demons because they had prideful thoughts about their feats. The devil can appear as an angel of light and even as Christ. And woe to the ascetic who lacks the humility to confess all these visions to his elder. The saint who empties himself from all selfish ambition cannot be deceived by the evil one because of the gift of spiritual wisdom, which is different the practical wisdom. Many people have practical wisdom, a very important element to deal with the everyday cares of this life. But in addition to this practical wisdom, a spiritual man is given wisdom that is from above, wisdom that is pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, full of good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The saint will embrace the virtuous man and the thief with the same love. We read in the life of St. Nicholas Planas, a very simple priest of Athens about a hundred years ago, we read about Alekos, his alcoholic chanter. 
Alex or Alekos would go into the altar during services and take money out of St. Nicholas' pockets to support his habit. This went on for years and many of the good people of the church told and advised this holy priest, look, Alekos is an embarrassment to our community. You must get rid of him. The saint refused. No, no, no. Aleko is good. He's a good man. You see, the saint looked behind the man's bad habit, behind his addiction and passion. And behind that, he saw the precious image of God in this person. The saints don't dare judge anyone. And many years later, Alekos got ill and died in deep repentance after holy confession and holy communion. And all this because of the gift of the fruit of the forbearance of saintly father Nicholas. Earthly wisdom alone would have thrown Aleko outside of the church as we do today on a daily basis with our sharp tongues, nasty stares, and cold treatment of those who came to church not dressed up to our standards. So the saints were gentle, peaceable, willing to yield, full of mercy and without hypocrisy. They accept people as they are. They embrace them, they love them as they are, and the grace of God will bring about their change in due season. The third element of uh, an Orthodox saying is the power of soul, which is the fruit of steadfast faith, the type of faith that moves mountains. Christ spoke about this power of faith on many occasions, and I will bring up at least three examples of this power of faith promised to the true believers by Christ. He who believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than these shall he do. And the third, he who believes in me, though he were dead, yet he shall live. So he who believes in me out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. This explains perfectly the life of St. Porfirios and St. Paisios and St. Yaakov of Suevia. Thousands of people quench their spiritual thirst with their living water. The saints are full of life, energetic, always fresh, always young at heart even at the age of 90, even with terrible illnesses. Their visitors always received consolation, strength, hope, the hope to go on and continue their struggle to carry their cross. We had the same phenomenon with St. John of Cranston, St. Seraphim of Sarov, St. Silwan, whose books are touching thousands of souls worldwide. He who believes in me, the works that I do will also do, and even greater than these, he shall do. A dreadful verse. But how is this possible? To do greater works than Christ. Yes, the saints will do greater works than Christ, not by themselves, but always by the power of the Holy Spirit. The saint becomes a dispenser of the grace of Christ, the grace of God. He's a spiritual transformer. One electrical transformer divides electricity in hundreds of homes. The saint is a vessel of grace and he dispenses God's grace to all those who come in contact with him, physically or noetically through prayer. Christ only resurrected three people in the New Testament and himself. St. John the Evangelist resurrected a few hundred people in Patmos during his adventures with one of the magicians on that island. The sweaty handkerchiefs and headbands of Apostle Paul were healing many people. But it only happened once in the life of Christ with a woman of the issue of blood. The shadow of St. Peter was doing miracles. Now, Peter was not greater than Christ. He was healing in, in the name of Christ. But this is the power of a saint, the Christian, who works towards Christian perfection. The one who believes in me, though he dies, he lives. St. Porfirius died very secretly and without fanfare, felt that his end was near, so he instructed his monks to take him to Mount Athos, where he was tonsured as a monk, and he gave strict orders not to publicize his death and only let people know about him passing on after his burial. He did not want hundreds of people to leave their families and their work to be at his funeral. 
A lot of his spiritual children who often called him for guidance did not know that he died for quite a while. A certain spiritual daughter called him 40 days after his death. He answered the phone. He spoke to her for a while. He guided her. And finally he said to her, listen, my child, please don't call me here again because I died 40 days ago. He who believes in me, though he dies, he lives. Why do we pray to the saints? Precisely because of these words of Christ. The true believers, the imitators of Christ, live. Our God is not a God of the dead, but a God of the living. You may have read about real tangible miracles of St. Nectarius, St. Marina, St. Raphael of Lesbos, who appeared as doctors in modern-day hospitals and supervised surgical procedures. Our Most Holy Theotokos uprooted the seat of an Air Force helicopter and saved a young faithful woman who called upon her name when the helicopter hit a cliff. Everyone died. The Most Holy Theotokos entered the burning helicopter at the speed of light and uprooted the entire helicopter seat and carried this young woman like a baby and set her on the ground. Two years ago, this was witnessed by several television stations in Greece. So our saints may not be everywhere, but they are fully connected with the frequency and power of the Holy Spirit, and they can commune with us in multifarious ways. So the Orthodox saint is full of virtues, full of godly and practical wisdom. He has steadfast organic faith, and the saint has a fourth element, something not of this world. The saint has a uniqueness about him. The saint lives between heaven and earth. He lives a life of signs and wonders. He lives the Lord's transfiguration, resurrection, and Pentecost from this life. He's at peace with himself, with God, and with the entire creation. Animals that are normally not so comfortable in the presence of men, like bears, foxes, snakes, and field mice, are totally comfortable in the presence of the saints. They recognize the state of Adam before the fall and the love of the saint towards the entire creation. Some others are very fragrant while alive. An intoxicating fragrance may come out of their mouth while speaking and spread everywhere in their immediate environment. This was the case with St. Paisios and Papa Ephraim of Katunakia. In some of our older and recent saints, we have the phenomenon of teleportation. We have several documented cases of this in the life of St. Paisios. This contemporary saint could be at Mount Sinai and at his cell on Mount Athos at the same time to speak to some Americans who had a great desire to see him and get his blessing. In the book, The Young Men, St. Paisios and the Guru, this rebellious young Orthodox man could clearly hear the voice of the elder thousands of miles away. These are unique phenomena in Orthodoxy. Some saints know the exact day of their death, or they will ask God to fall asleep on a certain feast day. St. John of Chrysostom was praying to fall asleep on the day of the exaltation of the precious cross of Christ on September 14th. These signs and wonders are granted to the friends of Christ because he wants to honor those who honor him with their obedience, faith, and love. These signs and wonders, the fragrant relics of the saints and their incorrupt bodies, are given by the Holy Spirit to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, according to St. Paul in Ephesians 4.12. The signs and wonders of the martyrs of all, their fearlessness toward death and their sacrificial love were the main instruments behind the conversion of the pagan Roman Empire to the Christian Roman Empire by the 4th century. Today's agnostics and atheists are not easily convinced by our theological arguments, by sermons and logical proofs about the existence of God. They are totally perplexed, however, and they come to their senses in the presence of a saint. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is what the world needs to see today. 
Along with our missionary efforts, the printing of Bibles, our, our beautiful churches and church services, our true doctrines and dogmas, they also need to see that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And our co-workers, friends, and relatives will experience this as we begin to imitate the life of our most holy Theotokos and the saints. Become holy, for I am holy, says the Lord our God. Amen.